1. A few years ago, I worked at a retail store where people would stop by to purchase video games. After about two years, our district manager decided that in order to properly open a store, the opening employee needed to arrive two hours before the store opened. He was such a stickler for this, he fired a good friend of mine for violating his policy. Granted, my friend would show up 15 minutes before the store was supposed to open, and would frequently skip a lot of the required opening duties. It was actually my friend getting fired that got me transferred to this particular store. Now the location was in a mall, and the store itself was about twice the size of your standard broom closet. This meant that including a 15 minute trip to the bank to deposit the cash from the previous day, it never took me more than an hour to get the store ready to be open. This meant that if I showed up at 9am I could easily have the store ready to open at 10am when the mall opened. Also showing up at an hour before the store opened gave me an extra hour to help out whoever was closing the store that evening with normal duties like processing shipments, organizing merchandise, being rude to your customers, etc. After about a week or two of this, I get a very angry call from the district manager. He had apparently wanted something at 8.15 one morning and called the store. But no one answered. He decided that no one was showing up to open the store properly. And that must mean that the store was a complete mess. I explained to him that the store was small enough that it didn't require two hours to get ready to open. Even if there was still things needed to be done from the night before, which, while not frequent, was common enough that I was used to it. I also explained that because of how corporate works the scheduling, me showing up an hour earlier meant I had to leave an hour earlier, which would increase the workload for anyone who was closing. He didn't want to hear it, as this was his policy, and I was the only one not following it in his whole district, and that if I didn't follow his orders, I could look for a new job. Well, not wanting to lose my sweet gig of selling video games to the colorful customers of this particular game store, I complied. So from then on, I would show up at 8am sharp every morning I was opening the store. I would get everything I needed done around the store by 8.30 and be back from the bank by 8.45. I would then sit on the counter and wait for 10am. Then I would leave an hour earlier than usual, so I had more time to do other things. I was going to college full time, so having an extra hour was actually a blessing. This however meant whoever was closing the store was on their own for an hour before the rest of the closing staff would show up. The true malicious compliance, however, came the day I was opening and the store manager had to call out sick. In order to save on possible overtime, which the company was completely against for any reason, the district manager agreed to cover her closing shift. This day just happened to be a day where it was particularly slow in the morning, so I had the store looking perfect when he showed up for the closing shift. To make things even better, the shipment for that day was late, so it showed up shortly before I was to clock out. On top of that, the traffic into the store picked up as I was having to leave. This meant that I left the district manager with a large shipment needing to be processed, a store full of snot-nosed kids and angry soccer moms, and no one to help him deal with this for at least another hour. Needless to say, the look of angry frustration on his face as I clocked out is one of my most cherished memories from my time at that store. 2. This story takes place many years ago while I was working as the help desk manager and system administrator for an online campus. Most of my job was doing support for the small office staff, 12 people at any given time, but I also did things like maintain our file DNS DHCP server, wireless, AV support for the conference room, phones, etc. I also supervised a small help desk of students who would respond to desk queries from online students and the occasional professor. I was also responsible for ordering any IT supplies we needed, including things from staples like blank CDs, labels for dimos, and what have you. Our account manager at Staples never put our individual names on packages when anyone from our office ordered anything. He just addressed them to our office and we'd pick up packages based on tracking emails we got or when we were expecting something. Even though we were a tiny office, Staples would sometimes just drop packages off mere hours after we placed an order, since we were in a decent sized city and our account rep was a stand-up guy. While working for this online college, the director hired Greta. 
the brand new financial manager and my district supervisor. After our last financial manager resigned, after months of coming into work drunk or hungover. Greta was having difficulty coping with the responsibilities and pressures that came with her new position. She had worked as a junior financial specialist at a sister campus and had been promoted to senior financial specialist when she came to work for us. She was young and it was obvious that she just didn't have the experience yet for this new level. As time went on, Greta became frustrated and was under a tremendous amount of anxiety because she just could not understand some of the finer aspects of her job and the central office was calling her out on her frequent mistakes. Meanwhile, the director came into work later and left earlier so he could work from home because all of his time in the office was being spent with Greta and trying to get her trained up on things. He was a decent director, a little too hands off, but he had a full plate of work as well and couldn't keep just dropping everything to spend hours with Greta, going over the same Excel sheet they had gone over days earlier. Thus, the rest of the office started bearing the brunt of Greta's frustration and anxiety. To be honest, we all felt really bad for her, but her attitude was emotionally charged, negative and defeatist. One of my co-workers, who was friends with a lot of people in the business offices on our sister campuses, lined up a junior financial specialist position for Greta closer to Greta's home. The central office okayed the move and, though it would be a demotion in title for Greta, the pay and benefits would be the same. The idea was that the other campus would be able to invest the time to train her to be a senior financial specialist, and we would hire a new senior financial specialist who could get rid of the backlog of work and stay permanently. It was win-win-win, or so we all thought. Greta didn't want the demotion, though. In the end, the effort that had been put into getting her a more appropriate job was wasted. The central office finally gave up, shrugged, and told our director to deal with it. It was around this time, about six months into her job, that Greta decided that micromanaging me would make her feel better. If I went to the restroom, I would need to let her know. If I went to the server room, I would have to let her know. If the white noise generator we had in the office was too loud, I was not allowed to adjust it. If I so much as needed a new mouse or CMOS battery, I had to ask for her permission. Because she was constantly busy and stressed out, she'd go for days without responding to my emails, and stupid little things like a broken desk phone couldn't get replaced because Greta wasn't giving me the okay. I was an army vet, used to working independently as the only IT person, and really didn't sweat the micromanaging. I was more amused than anything else. One day I had ordered something like pens or something with permission, of course, and Greta had ordered superglue. I got the package the same day, took my pens and gave Greta her superglue. She took it from me and closed her office door. Later on, I passed by her office while she was in the restroom and noticed that she had the glue next to a woman's pump, shoe, on the desk. Being curious, I peeked in a little more and noticed that she had purchased super glue on the state's dime to fix her shoe. This was not a big deal, but wasn't really allowed. Since Greta had been breathing down my neck and supervising me at a molecular level, I felt it appropriate to email the director and asked him to let her know that it wasn't a great idea to spend state money on personal purchases, no matter how small. He in turn forwarded the email I had sent him to Greta and told her not to do that again. Again, not a big deal. No one was going to lose their job over a $3 tube of superglue that was used for personal reasons. And I freely admit I was being a ninny boo boo tattletale for really no good reason. I just thought this would be a quick little jab at her for being a neck breather. But Greta decided that my roundabout way of chastising her was the last straw. She told the entire office, not just me, that she would open all packages from here on out, and that we were not to handle them at all. Okay. Did I mention that our Staples rep was a stand-up guy? It was because of him that I found out that I could order quite a few products individually wrapped, addressed, and shipped. I needed a new CMOS battery for a desktop in the office, but figured I should get a few extras just in case. After getting approval from Greta, for 10 CMOS batteries, they all arrived individually wrapped and enclosed in those grey plastic envelopes that really have to be cut open 
because they are too tough to open by hand. I also found out I could get blank CDs individually as well. So after getting permission, I ordered 100 blank CDs. We sent software via US mail to some online students who didn't have the bandwidth to download a required application for a specific class. All individually wrapped. The Staples courier wasn't thrilled, and her small mail slash break room was filled with 99 CD sized cardboard boxes, someone miscounted, for a few days until our cleaning person was able to take them to a recycling dumpster. A day later, Greta stopped approving my purchases, so I emailed the director himself, and since he was busy with real, actual work, just told me to go ahead and order what I needed, and that I didn't need to ask permission to order things anymore. I found out I could get those cheap no-name black ink pens individually. Same with the small stacks of post-it notes, sharpies, network patch cables, those little individually wrapped screen wipes, scotch tape, and mouse pads. The literal amount of plastic and cardboard that was flooding our office those few days was amazing. At one point, we had to fill an empty office with boxes left over from the canned air experiment. Staples was nice enough to break open a pack of 48 compressed airs and send them each individually wrapped in boxes the size of a small waste paper basket. Since Staples was using their courier for this and they weren't getting hammered with shipping charges, though the same day deliveries were taking a day or two now that the Staples van was maxed out on space. A week or two after I had ordered the CMOS batteries, I got a curt email stating that I could open packages once again. I responded, thanking her, and asked her if I could go to the bathroom. A few weeks later, Greta left for another position, and the office returned to normal. 3. Years ago I was young and hired as a specialist for a drug manufacturing startup. The company ended up making drug controls and standards instead, which are used to calibrate and set up the instrumentation used to detect drugs. My role as a specialist was to troubleshoot, create standard operating procedures, initiate, perform complete studies, and to do full analysis on the manufacturing process. My actual role devolved into doing everything from start to finish, receiving the raw material, making pilots, bulking it up, packaging it, and testing the materials between each step. To ensure it fell within specifications, I wrote, and shipping it out. It was grueling work and I often ended up working 60 to 80 hour weeks, which my fiancé was not a fan of, but it was my first job out of college and I needed the experience. I put up with this for about two years, before the startup got bought out by a larger company. Corporate decided it was best to assimilate the startup, but send in their management team to get the... Big Pharma feel and quality. In comes New Manager. Let's call him New Manager. It has been a while, so I'm paraphrasing most of it. New Manager. So, Livid, what do you do here? Me, well, I proceed to list everything I do, and how long my days typically are. We've been understaffed for a while, and I could really use the help. New manager. I see. You mentioned you wrote most of the SOPs for each product. Me, yes, I had to validate XYZ and author the documents myself. New manager. Okay, well, we have our own people who can draft these and help refine them. Could you email my people a list of all your document numbers? Me, okay. New manager. Oh, and... New manager proceeded to give me orders to follow their protocols and get caught up on their training, emphasizing how they're sticklers for rules and regulation. We inform all our customers that due to the changes we will be a week behind schedule, and most are understanding. After a week of training, new manager asks me to sign off on the charges they've made for every single SOP. And they completely trashed the old SOP and misconstrued most of the contents of each document. I bring it up and get promptly told to file a grievance via new manager. Me. Did you see what they did to the SOPs? New manager. They made them more efficient. There was too much technical language in the old drafts. We need anyone to be able to understand it. Me. They removed the control charts and sample regulations. New manager. Yes, they were deemed unnecessary. Me. Our chemists need to do those to fulfill government regulatory. New manager, please, Lifford, you do your job, and you let the engineers and our legal team handle government. 
I don't want to hear anything more about this. Your file says you're a QC analyst. You can leave the real thinking to the smart guys in QA. If you won't sign off on these, then we'll just ask someone else. Those words echo in my head to this day. New manager proceeded to demote me to their entry-level QC technician, with the same rate of pay to keep me around. He wants me to follow orders? Fine. I'm almost at my two-year mark. I'll just follow orders to the letter. I proceeded to do QC work on all the products exactly as they wrote in our shiny new SOPs, and pretty much everything was failing. Or at least, they would have known if they bothered to do math. They replaced most of the core staff because old staff refused to cut corners, and all our procedures were changed to the vague drivel that passed for technical writing. The products became inconsistent, with up to 48% CV variation in the final product. All of which would have been known about and subsequently failed if they didn't change my procedures. According to new procedures, they mostly passed. Mostly. Procedures say it's good to release. You got it, boss. I meticulously documented everything in their new computerized system, with the GMP, GLP, GDP compliant audit trail, in excruciating detail how, who, and why I did everything I did, even going so far as to reference the exact document numbers and versions. Per SOP, of course, I kept this up for two months. Almost all the products were sent back from the OEMs and after their own secondary QC testing. New manager. Livid, I need you to stay late for the next couple of weeks to figure out what's going on. Me, I followed the SOPs. Everything passes with flying colors. New manager. Then why is everything failing? Me, I wouldn't know. I hand him my letter of resignation. New manager, you can't quit now. We need you here. Didn't you troubleshoot these things before? I thought you wrote those SOPs. Me, you know I can't do that. I have to leave the thinking to the smart guys in QA. New manager, but we... Me, by the way, HR is making me use all my PTO effective tomorrow. Since I had too many hours and they can't cash me out. I had another job lined up with a more reputable company. Edit. Apologies, I omitted the aftermath. The site ended up on conditional probation status with the government, and nearly all their OEMs for the better part of eight months. New manager was culled for negligence and incompetent leadership, along with nearly half their staff on site. Or so I've been told. Four. For reasons that I won't get into here, the organization that I worked for spent an uncomfortable amount of time, before even planning and executing a plan to upgrade from Exchange 2007 to Exchange 2013. Exchange 2007 hadn't been patched in a year and a half as well, due to management being exceptionally gun-shy about any sort of change. Said environment had 45,000 users, 1.5 terabytes of public folder databases, spread across three data centers across the second largest country in the world. There's also a 36 Exchange 2013 server spread across two different data centers. The connections would come in through the local balancers to 2013, proxied to the 2007 environment. The 2013 servers didn't really do much, not having any mailboxes on them. Their primary goal was to run their warranty down. Due to the complexity of the environment, we had all kinds of crazy outages, hiccups, blips, and so on. The mere mention of patching the 2007 environment to help with stability, and the subsequent outages, gets middle management's hackles up. Now every time one of our middle managers, of which there were many, had a blip, outage, or hiccup on their phone or outlook, it was a severity A call to Microsoft. We'd be on support calls for five plus hours at a time, only to relay back that we'd need to patch, migrate, decom. We'd been on those pointless calls two or three times a week. Three plus hours into a support call, I needed to use the little boy's room, so I mentioned on the call and support chat that I'd be back in five-ish. Come back to the call to a separate message from a middle manager. Hey, where did you go? We need you! Was in the bathroom, mentioned it on the bridge and in the support chat. That's unacceptable. You cannot leave these calls for any reason. I'll be speaking with your other middle manager. Okay. 
No apology. Oh, sorry for having to poop. The next day I'm in the office, my middle manager in particular pulls me aside to give me shit for taking a shit, so I roll with it. He also sends an email for the paper trail, as it were. Head down to the local pharmacy, buy a bedpan, depends, and a condom catheter. Scan the receipts in, create an expense report, attach the don't leave your desk during severity A or else email for good measure. Month end comes around and my middle manager pulls me aside, asking me what the deal was with my expenses and why I needed a bedpan, depends, and a condom catheter. Remind him that he told me to never leave my desk no matter what happened. It's at that point he had an epiphany of exactly what he was requiring from his underlings. Henceforth, we were granted the privilege to relieve ourselves when we needed to. I have since moved on to greener pastures. Some say that the migration project is still going on to this very day. Oh, and my expenses were approved. 5. This all happened five or so years ago, while I was working for a proprietary trading firm. The company is a multinational and it had opened a new office in my city a couple of years before I joined them. For those who don't know, most prop shops, as I understand it, have a very high turnover rate. Just toss everyone in and keep those who stick. The company I worked for recruited every three months. It had space for about 120 traders, but the office was never full. Out of the 20 or so who were hired every quarter, only about five managed to make it beyond the three-month internship period, and of those, only ones, or sometimes none at all, made it past the additional three months probation period. The company was operating in my city for two years before I joined, and there were only about four people who I could have called permanent. Everyone else, about another ten, was either on their internship or on probation. The setup. I and about 25 others were recruited straight out of university. The internship paid really well for a first job, about twice as much as any other entry-level position in other financial institutions, plus bonuses once we went live, regardless of whether one is on internship, probation or permanent, and I was really excited. I first came across my boss, a really decent Indian guy, at an industry day held in our university. That was where they administered the IQ tests and I passed. The office, similar to other mid-sized operations, had a pretty flat management structure. Us traders were at the lowest level. The HR and ops manager was above us. And the office manager was, well, head of the branch. The boss gave you time off pretty much whenever you asked for it, as long as the day's objectives were fulfilled. That was his policy. However, the HR and ops manager was his opposite and then some. This lady was a grade A bitch, and I mean that sincerely. Let's call her Gabby. The instigating event. I first met Gabby when I went to their offices for my final interview. I was registering at the front desk when she marched from her office demanding some documents from the receptionist. The receptionist wanted to finish up with me first, but she was ordered off to file storage. Our exchange went like so. Gabby. You're one of the new ones. Me. Yes, I'm really excited. Gabby. Don't be. You don't look like you'll make it. Me. Why? Gabby. You're too soft. Gabby, but I can put in a good word for you if you give me a little something. A bribe. Me, <laughs> very funny. Gabby, I'm serious. Give something and I'll make it very easy for you. Otherwise, I'll make sure you don't even get into the interview. Me, no. Gabby, stupid idiot. Right to my face, and she kept her word. She made me sit in a hidden corner of the waiting room where no one would see me easily. But I could hear the conversations at her desk. The only reason why I got an interview is because I had impressed the boss at our previous meeting that he came to see why my CV wasn't there. Gabby said that I hadn't sent it in. The receptionist said that she had seen it somewhere. Then I walked up to the desk at the same time the receptionist said, Here it is. It was in the trash. And everyone stared at Gabby. From that moment of humiliation onwards, Gabby had a raging hate boner for me. You see, Gabby was a micromanager. More of a nanomanager, really. She made us have to request access if we wanted to access sites other than those on her approved list. And for traders who gain info from wherever they could find it, 
her list was woefully inadequate. She would call meetings at the most inopportune times, but only when the branch manager was not around. And in her lengthy meetings, you could never leave to check on your positions. She had this annoying habit of taking my lunch, and when I confronted her about it, she essentially told me to go fuck myself, that I could live with it. I just started bringing in two sets of lunch and kept on doing the job that I loved. Gabby was married with two kids, and she was pretty. I guess she liked the attention because she would have a stream of guys picking her up at the office for two-hour lunches and when she left for home some evenings. But not on Thursday. Thursdays were the days when her husband would come pick her up, towing their kids along. I think they went to have a family dinner or something. The mistakes Gabby made, round one. Our manager left about two months after I joined. I think he returned to India to get married or something, but still stayed with the company. Wished him all the best. None of the other permanent traders had the experience corporate required to take on a management role, five years at least, so they had to shop around. In the meantime, Gabby became the de facto head of the branch, despite the fact that her knowledge of future markets was rudimentary at best. Her first mistake was when she delayed my promotion from internship to probation. I am an excellent trader, and was easily top 5 in my group. Of the 26, she promoted the 20 she liked, kept me and another guy in internship, and fired 4. At around the same time, another recruitment drive happened, and another 20-ish interns were hired. I knew this was our beef rekindled and remixed, and I was actually surprised she held onto it for so long. It was also pretty unusual since the last thing my former boss did before he left was promote me from the simulator to a live trading account. But I kept my head down and continued learning, often going back to my former boss and the permanent employees to get advice. Another three months go by, and in the next evaluation I was shocked that I was still not brought up to probation. Despite the fact that all of the new recruits of the second group had been promoted, and I was easily the best and the only one trading live. I knew I was good at the job, the permanent guys all said so. The group I initially joined was frequently asking me for advice. To their credit, a few of them were good, but most of them were still on sim, and as a rule, no one advanced to probation while on sim. However, you could go live while on internship if you were good, which is what happened to me. So I was a live trader and making good money, but I was still on internship and passed over twice. I couldn't let go of that. I decided to talk to Gabby directly. I approached the senior guys and made my case, though I was careful not to put her in a bad light. They agreed to help me and so they did. About a month after she passed me over the second time, she gave me my promotion and I was now on probation. At this time she was still unsure of her power and was still afraid of the permanent traders. Those guys were like gods. Two months after my probation, another evaluation and recruitment drive. I was not promoted. The group I started out with was now permanent, despite having only two of them trading live. The group I was currently with on probation were all promoted to permanent status. The group behind me on internship was all promoted to probation, and another group was hired. I let it go, hoping she had got it out of her system. Sadly, she had not. Round two. Three months go by. I'm trading live and loving it, though still on probation. An evaluation comes up again and I'm not promoted, despite the fact that contract to contract, I was almost on a level with the permanent employees. The group that found me on probation was advanced to permanent status to a man, and none of them were live. The group behind me caught up to me and a new batch of newbies were hired as interns. I couldn't let this one go either. I approached the original four permanent employees who were now my very good buddies and planned to do the same thing as last time, only this time it didn't work. Gabby had grown into her sadistic power and flatly refused to even consider my promotion, even after she was presented with evidence that I was worth it. Her argument was along the lines of, I'm the boss, I can do whatever the hell I want. But I wasn't having that, so I contacted my former boss for help. At the time, he had been promoted to Head of Operations Africa. He was actually quite surprised, given my performance, that I was still on probation. 
Needless to say, the order came down from on high, and Gabby looked like she was shitting six pineapples simultaneously as she handed my letter. And I thought that was the end of it. How wrong I was. On the next recruitment, she hired this girl, let's call her Sue. Sue was an intelligent person all round, but she didn't have the emotional quotient to handle the market. Trading, as I was taught, requires two mental aspects, IQ and EQ. You can't improve IQ, but you can boost your EQ to deal with the numerous stresses that accompany the career. Sue had more than enough of the IQ part, but EQ, not so much. No worries, you can work on that. Just to recap, the office now had about 70 employees. Of these, over 30 were permanent staff, me included. But only 11 were trading live. Another 20 or so were on probation. But only 3 were trading live. None of the interns were live. The office needed to stay profitable if it was to stay open, which means that the money being earned by the 14 live traders was paying the salaries of everyone in the office. Rent, supplies, health insurance, pensions, etc, etc. Needless to say, corporate was not seeing a lot of returns from our branch. And as I came to learn later from my former boss, we're considering shutting down the branch and costing us our jobs, but I digress. The Last Straw the grade-A bitch Gabby took advantage of an inconsolable and desperate Sue to try and get me for sexual harassment. This is how it went down. Remember all those people still on Sim? Well, they all came to the eleven of us for trading advice, and we did what we could to help them. We divided up the Sim traders into groups, and I was mentoring about four people. Sue was one of them. As any trader will tell you, the period before profitability is usually one of losses, unless you're really good, and is filled with stress and fear, hence the need for high EQ. It's normal, and you get through it. Sue was going through such a rough patch one evening. We were going over her trades, bad trading day all around. When she just burst out crying, I know how it feels. I had shed my own tears as well, so I comforted her the best I could. I held her hand and patted her on the back awkwardly. To this day, I still don't know how to comfort someone, until she quieted down. What I didn't know was that Gabby had seen us. As I came to learn later, she approached Sue the following day and made her an offer. Gabby would make sure Sue kept her job and would get her a lot of money if she stated that I had sexually harassed her. Sue took Gabby up on the offer, and what followed was a nightmare. It started with a formal reprimand from corporate, a hearing in which I wasn't present to defend myself because Gabby forgot to send me the summons. Apparently she lobbied quite viciously to get me fired. The only reason I was able to keep my job was that my former boss came to my defense. Despite his help, I lost my quarterly bonus, about 100,000 US dollars, and half of my holdback, about 400,000 US dollars. I also had to attend seminars which essentially involved watching the same film on sexual assault in the workplace, three hours long, until I stated in writing that I was an abuser and it would go on my record. I knew that if that happened, Gabby would have the ammunition she needed to ruin my life forever. So every day, I got into the office at 7 in the morning, watched the three hour film until 10, refused to acknowledge it, then get to work, leave the office at 11.20 at night, rinse and repeat for almost seven months. It was tiring and torture, and Gabby never let me live it down. All of the people I had been mentoring were transferred the day after my reprimand. A day after that, Gabby informed me via letter that my clip size had been cut from 1,000 to 20 contacts. Yeah, I had to admit, I was bloodied, I was down, but the bitch didn't know that she should have ended me. The Revenge Step 1. Ruin Gabby's Career I started compiling all the shit that was happening to me in the office. It started when I realized that when I went out to lunch, someone would open my desk drawer and mess around with my notebook, where I jotted down my trading ideas for the day. The only person who had a key apart from me was Gabby. Apparently she had mastered my lunchtime routine for the entire 45 minute break, and would open my locker when I was out smoking. She would then copy down my trading plans for the day and give them to Sue. I even saw them at it once, but they didn't see me. I documented it, I let it go on for a while so that I could establish a pattern via Sue's trades, I then approached two of the permanent traders who were closest to me and told them my plan. 
Remember when I said almost no money was reaching corporate, and that there were only 11 live traders? The situation had only gotten worse. The office was now full, but we had less than 15 live traders. Live trading could only be approved by head of operations, my former boss, and he was a strict one. Now imagine that my earning capacity had been cut by over 90%. My two friends agreed to my plan that they slowed down their trading by around 50%. This essentially put the branch in the red, and three weeks later we were told that the head of ops and other head honchos were coming down. The next phase involved getting Sue into a corner. Please, a tear or two, and revealing that I could prove she had been stealing my work were enough to get a written statement from her that Gabby had orchestrated my whole sexual harassment thing. Step 2. Ruin Gabby's marriage. It took only a little investigation on my part to realise that all those men who visited the office were actually Gabby's lovers. She would leave for two-hour lunches with her phone turned off. I took advantage of one such period. Gabby left and I snuck into her office to find her Facebook profile open. Everyone knew she was always on there, and it was a sore point because she had banned it for the rest of us minions. I got into her messenger and voila! Explicit texts, nudes, rants about her husband and his inadequacies, the six guys or so she had cheated with, all of it. I copy-pasted the data into her private email, which she was logged into as well. Always clear cash, you guys. And sent it to my private email, then deleted it from her sent folder. Now I had the ammo on my phone ready to send. Step 3. Ruin Gabby's relationship with her kids. Now I'll say right off the bat that I'm not proud of this step. But to bust my justice nut, it wasn't enough to just send the info to her husband. So I waited for Thursday when I knew he would be passing by the office with the kids. The pro-revenge god saw fit to bless me that day. Because it was the same day that the corporate head honchos were riding into town. Thursday. I was at the office at 7 as usual, with all my documentation from my appointment letter to the numerous rejected requests for promotion, set through the three-hour sexual harassment video, yes, I was still doing that, and waited for the moment. The guys from corporate, my former boss included, arrived and went straight into a meeting with Gabby. I was quite certain that they would call me in to know why I had been attending a sexual harassment awareness class for almost a year and I was ready for them. I was called in after lunch at about two. The question was asked, and before I could answer, Gabby jumped on the bit like I knew she would. She went on a long rant about how I had been insubordinate, and how I liked to touch female employees. I could tell from her grin that she thought she was winning. And then I pulled out Sue's letter, and the grin curdled on her face. Sue was hurriedly called in, and she backed my story. She said she was sorry, she was fired on the spot, and told to go wait at the receptionist for her final check. I felt no sympathy. I was on a roll. Next, I pulled out my analysis of my trades and told them how Gabby had been breaking into my locker and stealing my notes for Sue. Gabby denied it. Sue was called back in. She denied it. My former boss logged into the company network, pulled Sue's and my trading data, compared the positions taken by both of us with my notes. He said it was true. So he was fired again. They told me they would refund my confiscated bonus and hold back, with an extra 50 grand. That was fine by me, the justice was enough. And then I spotted Gabby's husband heading into her office as usual, with their two kids in tow. I pulled out my phone, grinned at her and said, Your husband is here. She turned around and saw him. She excused herself for a minute to tell him to wait. My former boss said, sure. I pressed send. Edit, as for the aftermath, Gabby's husband absolutely lost his shit. Her office was glass-walled, and the rest was open plan so we could all hear what they were shouting about. He finally left with their kids in tow, sorry, little ones. Gabby followed him, still shouting at him. Then she saw us all standing around, and the look on her face was priceless, as she was wondering which aspect of her life to try and salvage. She let her husband go, but about an hour later, she had been fired. My favourite boss stayed behind since there was no one left. He stayed for a month, training the lady who had been with the company the longest to take over as manager. She is easily the most brilliant mind I had ever met. 
Unfortunately, the branch was still struggling with so many employees who were not generating income, and they had to shut it down. But they transferred all their performing employees to their other various branches. In London, two branches, and India, nine branches. So I guess no one undeservedly lost their jobs. I still stalk Gabby on Facebook. There have been a lot of I'm single because I'm too awesome posts of late. I almost feel sorry for her. But I remember the three-hour video, and I stopped being foolish. From what I could see on LinkedIn, Sue bounced around from firm to firm until she found a position as a research analyst. My favourite boss is still at the firm. We talk from time to time. I took a break from trading for a while. After all the shit that went down, I needed a break. So I didn't take them up on their offer to relocate to India. Went to work with a buddy of mine who has a consultancy. When I feel ready, I'll go back to the market. For me at least, there is no other job as challenging and satisfying. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Revenge's Ice Cream number 4. I think you get why I call it that by now. Thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. This one was a bit of a beast, I didn't expect it to turn out that long. But there we go. Well, I'm afraid I have some disappointing news, folks. As you all know, I have a... a passion for a watermelon-flavoured rock star. But alas... But the only, only local store that sells it hasn't had it in stock for about two weeks. Two weeks without any. I've had to settle for different flavours, like some kind of commoner. Blueberry and pomegranate? Pah! Let the peasants drink it. Although it is actually quite nice. I even looked on Amazon, because they're actually fairly reasonable for their 12 packs right now. Packs of 12 cans. Uh, but nope, they're out of stock with the watermelon. What's the hell freezer to do? Well, I suppose stop drinking energy drinks would really be the best thing for me to do, but I've cut back, so we'll see. Ah, well, with that I'm going to head off for now, so until next time, thank you very much for listening, and take very good care of yourselves.